So now we've had a look at internal combustion engines and jet engines. We know that jet engines can power aircraft, and indeed aircraft that can fly at high speeds. But how good are jet engines? How fast can we get them to go? The good thing about a jet engine is that you can use it to take off from a runway. So we can start off from zero speed. And jet engines are capable of reaching speeds of around Mark 3.5. So they are not capable of getting us above Mark 5 and into the hypersonic regime. Remember from our previous unit that the Mark number indicates how many times the speed of sound an object is moving. So if we're flying at altitude, where the air temperature is lower than at the ground level, then the speed of sound is around 300 metres per second, around that 1,000 kilometre per hour mark. Therefore, jets are good for getting us up to speeds of around 1,000 metres per second, that is 1 kilometre per second or around 3,500 kilometres per hour, but not for getting us up to hypersonic speeds. So what are the limitations with jet engines? What could we do to make the jet engines go faster? In a jet engine, we have very low speeds in the combustion chamber. In fact, in a jet engine, the speed of the flow as it passes through the combustion chamber is very much subsonic. So if we're flying at supersonic speeds, we must slow the flow down through the intake and the compressor so that it's moving at a low subsonic speed as it passes through the combustor. As we go faster, in just bringing the flow from high speeds as it enters the, the engine to subsonic speeds in the combustion chamber, the pressure and temperature of the gas increase. The higher the speed that our engine is operating at, the higher are the pressures and temperatures that we will get when we slow the flow down. We'll find out more about the relationship between Mach number and gas pressure and temperature in the second section of the course, which is about isentropic flow. Now, in the jet engine, it's the role of the compressor to raise the pressure and temperature of the gas. So if we're going fast enough, we really don't need the compressor because just slowing the flow down to subsonic conditions will raise the pressure and temperature to levels where we can do good combustion. Therefore, for a jet engine travelling at very high speeds, we don't need a compressor. If we don't need the compressor, then we don't need the turbine, because, as we saw in the last video, the turbine is just there to drive the compressor. So we can throw away the compressor, we can throw away the turbine, and we'll see what we have left. Well, what's left is a ramjet. So a ramjet is a jet engine without a compressor or a turbine. The ramjet has an inlet to take the air in and slow it down. In so doing, the inlet raises the pressure and temperature of the air. We then inject some fuel in the combustion chamber and we add the energy of the combustion of the fuel to the flow. And then we exhaust the gas through a nozzle. And just as with the jet engine, if we can produce a flow coming out of the nozzle at a higher momentum than it came into the engine, we can potentially produce thrust from the engine. So how fast can we get a ramjet to go? Now here's the first important limitation of ramjets. Ramjets can't start from zero speed because they need to be moving in order to force the gas into the intake. So maybe around Mark 3 would be a good starting point for a ramjet engine. And then they can take us up to around Mark 6. Then if we want to try to push a ramjet up to higher speeds, just the ram effect of forcing the air into the engine raises the pressure and temperature up to levels where the temperature is just too high to be able to do good combustion. So we really don't need to slow the air down to subsonic conditions. What we can do instead is slow the flow down just a little bit, thus raising its pressure and temperature a bit, but leave it supersonic and see if we can burn the fuel in the air. And an engine that does just that is called a scramjet. So a scramjet engine 
has an inlet where we slow the flow down, raising its pressure and temperature. We have a combustor where we inject some fuel. The flow is still travelling supersonically through the combustion chamber, where the fuel burns and releases its heat. Maybe it slows down a little, but it still stays at a supersonic speed. And then we exhaust the gas through a nozzle. Again, if we can get the gas coming out of the engine at, with a higher momentum than it came into the engine, then we can potentially produce some thrust. Here is an example of a small model scramjet engine that was tested in one of our shock tunnels, the T4 Stalker Tube at the University of Queensland. And this scramjet was the first complete scramjet powered vehicle that was demonstrated to be capable of producing enough thrust to overcome its drag. The photograph shown here is a version of the engine when it was tested in the shock tunnel. This engine consisted of a conical intake and it had six combustion chambers located around a cylindrical centre body. And then it has a series of six nozzles. And we put this scramjet on a force balance and tested it in the tunnel. We injected some fuel into the combustion chambers and we measured the overall force on the engine when it was in a hypersonic flow in the shock tunnel. Producing more thrust than drag meant that this scramjet would be capable of accelerating. You can see that a scramjet engine is very simple. There are no moving parts, so you can look straight through the engine from the intake to the exit and you don't see any moving parts inside. So how fast can a scramjet engine go? Scramjet engines can potentially operate at speeds as slow as around Mark 6, so at around the speed where the ramjet engine cuts out. At this lower speed, there's a crossover region where we could use either a ramjet or a scramjet. But what about the upper end? We're not sure what the upper Mark number limit is for a scramjet. We know we can reach Mark 10, there have been some experimental scramjets flown at Mark 10 conditions. Mark 12 may be possible. It would be nice if we, get up, we could get up to Mark 14. But this is still an open question at the moment. Then what happens is we again get to the conditions where slowing the flow down, to, we get to too high temperatures for us to be able to burn the fuel and release the energy of the fuel into the flow. Another problem that we run into is that the aerodynamic drag forces on the vehicle become very high at high Mach numbers. And the heating problems become really severe. So where do rockets fit into the picture? Rockets are not air breathing engines. They're completely self-contained in that they must carry both their fuel and an oxidizer with which to burn the fuel so that we can release the chemical energy contained in the fuel. So the big difference is that whereas an internal combustion engine, a jet engine, a ramjet and a scramjet all take their oxygen in from the air through which they're flying, a rocket has to carry its oxygen with it. The good thing about rockets is that they can operate in almost any environment. Rockets can operate in the Earth's atmosphere, they can operate in space or in the atmospheres of other planets and moons. So they're very versatile. But because they must carry their fuel and oxidizer, and the mass of the oxidizer required can be very large, rockets are pretty heavy compared with their air breathing counterparts. Therefore, they are potentially less efficient than the air breathers. So if we're looking to fly through the Earth's atmosphere at hypersonic speeds, then the scramjet looks like being a very attractive option. Let's finish by summarising the engines and their operating regimes. Jet engines can operate from zero speed up to around 3.5 times the speed of sound. Ramjets are good for around Mark 3 to Mark 6. And then scramjets are suitable for the higher hypersonic Mark numbers. We're still not sure how far we can push into the hypersonic regime with scramjets. Rockets are less efficient but they can operate over all the Mark number regimes. In the next unit, we'll derive and use the so-called rocket equation to see why we might want to use a scramjet engine for a stage of a launch vehicle.